I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Prince of Peace, our Redeemer, the King. I thank uh, the Lord for the opportunity to be sharing with you scripture that I have read probably more than any other scripture in the Word of God that I have landed on and titled The Prime Directive. The Prime Directive. If some of you uh, are Star Trek, Star Trek fans, you'll know what that means. I'm not. But the implication of the three words together weigh heavily on my heart. I was just speaking to my brother and sister who are sitting in front of me saying, I have preached this sermon before in other churches, and it's the first sermon I always preach in a church I go to as a guest. And I cannot believe that I have not offered this scripture in my own church. I know I have offered it to the young adults as the very first sermon that I've given them, but not to the morning and the entire body of the church at ABBC. Hence, I ask the Lord as I stand before you that the scripture that has been read many a time, that many of you probably have memorized, that would be even considered common, be a chance for my life and for your life to be changed only through the grace that's given through the Holy Spirit and through God our Father, Son, and the presence of His Spirit. Amen. Our scripture will come today from Dr. Luke's Gospel of the 10th chapter, and I'm going to read the very last verse first, as I have accustomed to do, hoping that you will ask the question, how? Luke chapter 10 Verse 28, and Jesus said, you have answered correctly, do this and you shall live. Do you want to know how to live? Let's break apart that word for a second, what it means, and you shall live. Amidst the time around the world, and I just got off a one-hour phone call with South America and my brother at uh, Montevideo, Uruguay. Amidst a time like this around the world and the implications of what it means to be apart and to now meet in electronically, to be in our little bubbles at home with our wife, maybe children, to have actual constant touch with five to 10 people. What does it mean to live? Living doesn't seem to be as robust as it once was. I told my wife this morning, I miss going to the restaurant with you. And she named two of her favorite restaurants and I named one of my favorite. We miss it. It, living has seemed to have been altered or changed. When Christ turned to the person he was talking to and said, yes, you are correct. Do this and you shall live. I would hope that you would immediately want to see what it is that Christ was asking. And this is how it goes. The gospel, the good news, according to Dr. Luke, and may I add his extreme attention to detail, as doctors do, verse starting from 25 of chapter 10. 10, 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Let's stop there for a second. We have Two people that are in front of us, Batgeratsur Yergu Ansik. Two people, number one, an expert in the law, a, a, a Pharisee, an attorney, a lawyer, Iravapan. He was an expert in the law. And let me tell you this that in antiquity, if you were an expert in the law, a Pharisee, you will have memorized the Torah, the first five chapters of our Bible. 
you will be able to start in the beginning and finish at the end of the fifth chapter of the Torah, the law. He was an expert. And the word of God says in verse 25 that he stood up, Middle Eastern uh, respect, uh, as he was about to speak, undoubtedly, all the room got quiet, and he stood up for one purpose, not to ask the teacher, Jesus, Rabbi, for counsel, but the word of God says, on an occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. In the process of entrapment, he didn't have anything that he was preparing to receive. He was preparing to win. Uh, regrettably for him, he didn't realize that he was going to test his creator. God, fully incarnate as man, yet fully God. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Aha, uh -huh. the question. The question that Jesus answered to, you are correct, and if you do this, you will live. The question that inherently is the biggest question that is asked of humanity that wants to live. How can I do this forever? Those during Jesus' time, even 100 years ago, would never dream that today people would cryogenically freeze their brain so that they can be brought back either robotically and inserted or be made alive forever. That is the answer to many who want to live forever as they give orders to freeze their brain in millions of dollars that they spend so that it will be brought back to life when technology allows. Is that what it means to live forever? So in the process of testing Jesus, the expert in the law said, what must I do to have to inherit eternal life? What must I do to live forever? And the smartest embodiment of human that has ever lived, the creator, according to John chapter 1, turned to him and said the following. Verse 26. What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? Fascinating. Oh, if I would have just a morsel of that kind of wisdom. Jesus, of course, knew the answer, but he didn't answer. He said, what is written in the law? Don't forget, this is the expert in the law. And then he said, how do you read it? Verse 27. I would expect that you can hear a pin drop in the room. The expert in the law immediately recited Deuteronomy 6.5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18. And Jesus responded, you have answered correctly. Do this and you shall live. Well, if I were in the room listening to this discourse between the expert in the law and the controversial Jesus, I would gasp. <gasps> I mean, everybody knew the prime directive. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then the codification, the completion of the law of love your neighbor as yourself, and you're good to go. The prime directive. 
Now the problem. The problem is, as I've mentioned to you before, that my realization at 42 years old, now 15 years ago, that as a person deeply blessed in being born into a Christian family, being led to Christ by my mother at the tender age of five, to be grown up even in this church with godly instruction of teachers that are still with me as my friends, that at 42, I stopped and looked at this verse and I said, I can recite it, but I can't say I know what it means. For example, can you now, and if you're sitting in a room with someone, your spouse, your child, turn to them and be able to articulate what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart? May I ask you with all due respect, do you know what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart? If you can articulate that and explain that, then I would ask, what does it mean to love your Lord, your God, with all your mind? Next, with all your strength. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your soul? Let's make it a little bit more difficult, maybe easy. What is your heart? What is your soul? What is the difference between your heart and your soul? What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your mind, as opposed to loving the Lord your God with all your heart? What is the heart? What is the mind? What is the soul? What is your strength? Who is my neighbor? Uh, in the following several minutes, I will tell, do my best to explain to you, as I have been mentored, on the meaning and the purpose of the prime directive. First, and how many times have you asked your child, or another if you're a Sunday school teacher, and I'll say it in two languages, have you given your heart to the Lord? Or if you ask a child who has grown up in Sunday school and you ask them, where is God? Where is Jesus? The child will most probably respond something to the effect of like, Jose, he's here. <laughs> But is it here? Or is it here? This heart is going to be looked at by a cardiologist on Tuesday. Is he going to see Jesus there? If I am to understand what the prime directive is to inherit eternal life forever, and if the Expert in the law asked my creator the question, and my creator says, you are correct, do this and live, then I want to know decisively what it is that I'm saying. Your heart. Dallas Willard explains the heart in three different ways that all mean the same thing. Your heart is your will, kugampkut. It's your will. It's the what you want to do automatically without even thinking. The nature of your heart, the nature, punuchuna, is it is a spirit. You can't see it. You can see me, but you can't see my heart. Hence, as you look at me now, you are looking at the intersection of what you can see and what you can't see my spirit, which is also known as a heart, which is my will, and my body. You don't know what I'm thinking. It's unseen. You can't see my heart. It's unseen. 
But the things that you've noticed me do, if you've known me for a year or 50 years, over and over and over, give you a glimpse of my heart, which is my will, gompkus, which by nature is a spirit. It exists, but you can't see it. Only God sees it. And in the word of God, it says, it is the heart that he looks at. Let's take the next word, and then I'll start to braid them together. Let's talk about the mind. The mind. Now, maybe if you were to crack my skull open, you would see gray matter, the crenellations in my brain, but you wouldn't be able to see what it is, the information that the neurons were carrying across the left and right hemisphere of my brain. The Word of God says to love the Lord your God with all your mind. J.P. Moreland has written a wonderful book of the same title, Loving the Lord Your God with All Your Mind. Pick it up, read it, let's have a chat. My mind is what processes information. My mind is what takes in information through my eyes, through my ears, and processes it with my experience. Example of a child. My grandchild is a year and a half old. When he sees me, he calls me by name, Papa. And then inevitably, almost every single time, the second word out of his mouth is garage, 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 Papa garage, Papa garage. In the best way his little lips can move, Luke says garage. Why? Experience has told him as he processes in that little 18 month old brain that Papa spends time fixing things in the garage and he loves to help me. He sits on top of my workbench. He always has a tool in his hand. He is spending time with a person he knows that adores him, that loves him. And that experience has been born into, engraved into his brain so that his brain automatically, without thinking, tells his heart, his will, I want to go to the garage. Because that's a cool place for Luke. Now he has a bunch of really cool places. That one is one I share with him, which is why I give it to you as an example. Let's take the two together, mind and will. As a summary again, the will, gompk, is what you instinctively do because of what it's been programmed by the brain. The mind processes information and goes down to the heart and after doing that many, many, many times, many, many times, many, many times, we say things like, and it's more effective in Armenian, I'll translate it, sirdas khorovatskuze. Which uh, literally translated says, and again, it's better in Armenian, my heart wants a barbecue, shish kebab. I am so hungry that I will to have shish kebab. And trust me, especially if you're a guy my size and you're hungry, you'll find it. You know how to do it. The mind processes information and the will reacts. Let's take one more and then blend it together. As the expert turned to test Jesus and he said, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turned to him and said, what does the law say? You know it, may I add? And he said, he answered Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. 
Let's take strength. As you look at the original text and understand what strength is, it is very the simplest thing to understand, and that is, it's my body. Dallas calls it the power pack. The combination of bone, muscle, and skin, the organs that work within, my eyes, my ears that take in information, my mouth that expels information, the brain as the control center that downloads information to my heart, which is my will and my spirit, and then my spirit, my heart, that which you can't see, tells my body, preach today, at this time. Our bodies are power packs that manifest what we are processing, also based on experience, that program our heart, our will, which is a spirit, to go to church or not to go. If you play a piano, you know this to be a fact. That which you practice over and over and over and over and over again allows you to sit at the piano and through muscle memory do what you are not able to do without practice. That's why our will, Mergampka, continues to do what it has been programmed to do. And that's exactly what Christ is saying, give to me, your heart. The word of God says that if you believeth in him, what you're doing is you're taking, and forgive me for doing this, but it's more helpful when I point to this, that get your, give your will over to God and say, in Armenian, im let it not be my will, but yours. That's the will, which you can't see, because it's a spirit. And it is made to be true, based on what the, heart, the mind has processed over and over again. This example, I believe I've given to you before. I have visited people on their deathbed both Christian and not. For a non-Christian to knowingly be on their deathbed, there is one distinctive difference between a Christian, and that is fear of un uncertainty. Of uncertainty of what? of what? Of what the expert in the law is asking. Eternal life. There is fear and uncertainty in what will happen when they die because they don't have the peace of Christ. Now, here comes the hard part, and I'm picturing him vividly. This was maybe five years ago. A brilliant man, a mechanic, a person who can fix anything, an industrial engineer. I was asked to visit him by friends of mine who have known him for decades. I went to visit him. After the pleasantries, knowing that the doctors had given him three months at the most to live, I asked him, are you at peace with your diagnosis? He looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Ariel, I'm scared. I'll never forget that. City of hope in Duarte. I'm scared. He didn't have to tell me what he's scared of. Because if the expert in the law was asking, what must I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? What this gentleman was saying is, I'm scared of what will happen when I die. Uncertainty. I made one of the biggest mistakes in my life. I know I've confessed it from this pulpit, but I don't know if it was in this, in this context. Because in my head, I knew that he was going to live three months, I said to him, you're a Jew, I'm a Christian, how about I visit you again in a couple days and we start reading 
your Bible, the Torah. And let's see what we can learn together. He said that would be good. And I left. Within two days, he went into unconsciousness. He died within two weeks. I was never able to tell him what the good news was. I missed my opportunity and promised myself I will never make that mistake again. And this is the part that haunts me. I was scared to tell him right away because when I was at another deathbed, the old man said to me, when I did tell him the good news, I just can't. I just can't what? I just can't accept Christ as my savior. Why? You're dying. You know, Ariel, after so many years of living, it's just hard to change the way you are. And because I had remembered that, I thought to the other gentleman at City of Hope that I would say it on maybe day two, or we have three months, and maybe on day four, and we, we all know that it's nothing I can say to convince anyone, neither you. It's only the Holy Spirit that quickens a person's heart. The heart. You know, your, your will. Your will to say, even though my whole life I've been a certain way, even on my deathbed, I give my will to you. Have you made that decision? Because that's what God asks, to give your heart, which is your will, which is unseen, which is your spirit, over to him. Yet it is that same heart that has been programmed over and over and over and over and gets to a point of callousness and hurt and um, in, in treachery, in, in confusion that only God's Holy Spirit can quicken and turn. Sunday school teachers, I salute you with a respect that is due only of you, that you speak to the tender young hearts of children in whatever ways that God allows you to creatively. Mothers and fathers, don't let the Sunday school teachers be the only means of forming that will, the spirit, the heart of a child, because they have them for one hour on Sundays, you have them all the time rest. Read with them. Show them grace. Teach them according to the word of God. As the expert turned to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you should know. You should know better than everybody. What does the law say? How do you read it? And the expert quoted Deuteronomy 6.5 and says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and with all, and love your neighbor as yourself. What is the soul? I'm going to pause for 10 seconds as you're listening to me through this video broadcast. If you're with a person, turn to them immediately and explain to them the difference between your soul and your spirit. It's hard, isn't it? Now, I don't want to put myself on a pedestal and say, well, I can explain it. You can't. Uh, undoubtedly, there are many out there that are listening to me that could school me on the difference between a spirit and a soul. Let me offer to you how I have been taught according to the word of God. Your soul is a combination of your heart and your mind and your power pack, your body. 
Your soul is the ribbon that is tied around the box that says and insert your name. The soul is what is formed from the combination of what the brain processes that trains the heart, that tells the body what to do, where to go, what not to do. Yet there is one thing that is extremely important that I have left out intentionally. Who is my neighbor? I mean, if I'm going to love the Lord my God with my will, which is my spirit, also known as my heart, to, that has been programmed by my mind, that tells my power pack, my strength, where to go, what to do. Who is my neighbor? We lived 33 years next to a family. They watched our children getting born, we watched theirs. I could tell you the color of the pajamas they wear. We were neighbors. But that is not my primary neighbor. When the word of God says, love your neighbor as yourself, the first person I am to love after my will being given over to Christ is my wife. I am not to love my wife if I don't love Christ first. Let's put the uh, blocks in the right order. Primero Dios, God first. Kohar. After loving my wife, my next closest neighbor are my children. We are responsible for them. Until they get to a point of maturity where they are making decisions by their own will, which was formed while you were there for 50, uh, 20, 25 years, sometimes 30 years. Encourage them in the way of the Lord. Instruct them in the way of the Lord, for they will be independent of you. And that is biblical too, as they leave you and cleave to another. My neighbor is my wife after the love of Christ, then my children. Then I would say those that God has entrusted me with. And God has entrusted me with a handful of young men. And they are my neighbors before the person I live next to. And then I would say that as I love my wife and I love my children in this priority, and those that God has entrusted me to, that it would be those that I regularly see at my church, my neighborhood, who I bump in at the store, could quickly become my neighbor. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turned to him and said, what is written in the law and how do you read it? And the Pharisee said, the expert in the law said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus turned to him and said, you are correct. Do this and you shall live. And now I have left the most important word out of all that scripture and would offer to you a definition. What is love? There is high likelihood that you're going to be watching this sermon on what America calls Valentine's Day. I don't know if Canada does or other countries do, but I know it's true in America. My uh, little bit of understanding is that it was created uh, from the retail market so that I would buy my wife uh, exorbitantly expensive roses and chocolate and we go out on a date. And um, forgive me, but neither Kohad or I ascribe to any of that. I'm not gonna take my wife flowers or on a date on the one evening that other people have told me I need to love her. Maybe more. I'm sorry, I'm just not gonna ascribe to that. There is no other day during the year 
that should be any different in the love that I show my wife that I maybe should show on Valentine's Day. But it would not be a coincidence at all that I offer to you what Christ says as the prime directive. And it is to love the Lord my God with my entirety, my soul, which is comprised of my heart, my body, my strength, my mind, which processes information, and those that are my neighbors. Im on porch euchanus with my entire soul. So that when the day comes that I close my eyes and I don't breathe anymore, that this power pack body is miraculously transformed by the grace of God into a glorified body. And the part that is not seen, the intersection of that which you can see and that which you can't see is in presence of God forever and ever. Again, I ask you, then what is this thing called love? Well, for those of you that are my age or around, or maybe even the young adults that have heard oldies but goodies, if you were to ask the, the, the music world, a lady named Tina Turner would say, it has nothing to do with it. It's just a secondhand emotion. What an abhorrible lie. Consider love to be the following definition. The will of the good of another. The will of the good of another. I love you means I will your good. This morning, I had a one hour phone conference with a young man who I've met once. And at the end of the conversation, he said, love you, Ariel. Whenever somebody says, love you, in my memory, I have never not said, in other words, 100% of the time, I will say, is it difficult for you to say I in front of love you? This young man had no issue laughing, which is almost always what I hear, and then saying, I love you, Ariel. And when people have difficulty saying, I love you, I offer them this definition that come from the founders of our church, the will of the good of another. In other words, I will your good. So let's end this way. On what I consider to be the most important prime directive in the word of God, that if you don't understand the basics of the prime directive, consider twice going to the next step and trying to interpret or forming your own theology. For when the expert in the law came in front of Jesus to test him, to trap him, and said, what must I do to live forever, to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus said, you tell me what you've learned. And he said, well, what I've learned is to love my Lord, my God, with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, Deuteronomy 6, 5, and to love my neighbor as myself, Leviticus. And Jesus said, yeah, do this and you shall live. So I ask you, be responsible in your understanding of the basics of our faith. Don't just say love you if you don't even know what love means, especially when it comes to your creator. Don't say I give my heart to you if you don't under even understand what loving the Lord your God with all your heart is, it's your will. Understand how it's formed, it's through practicing like a pianist does, what you do over and over and over again your spiritual disciplines, your thought life, what you allow to come into your eyes, what you restrict from coming out your mouth, which forms your heart and never forget the priority of who your neighbors are. And then you shall see where your body goes. Jesus first, primero Dios, my wife, my children, those that God entrusts me with. 
And when you do that, you will be living the prime directive. You'll be glorifying God because your will has been given over to him. You will be in training for reigning with him forever, Revelation 22.5. You will do good works as an outcome of your faith, 1 Thessalonians 1.3. You will live from the heart Jesus gave you. So go and live from the heart Jesus gave you. Let's pray. As I become aware by your grace of your presence, Lord God, I ask that you teach me the basics of what even the Pharisee recited but didn't understand, that I would not cause others to stumble, but to live because my example is Christ alone. And let it be so on this day so that we will love knowing what it is that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.